coming up on the Ultimate Health Podcast. They built an entire campus and kind of committed to bamboo because they had decided that it should be a very green school. Even reclaimed timber is a cool thing, right? But it doesn't speak to the future because you can use it all up. Bamboo you can grow, use within like four years and then grow more of. If everyone needed it, like you could just grow it. And there was this bounty to that that just like set the bar. Hello and welcome to Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 373. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, I'm chatting with Alora Hardy. She's the founder and creative director of Iboku. She was raised on the beautiful island of Bali, where Alora was inspired by the highly skilled local craftsmen as well as by the talented jewelry designs of her parents. She spent 14 years of her young adult life in the United States, where she received a degree in fine arts and went on to New York City to design prints for Donna Karen that would walk the world's runways. In 2010, Alora left her successful career in the fashion world to carry on the incredible work of the design-build team that created the world-renowned Green School in Bali, founded by her father, John Hardy. She reconnected with the culture and landscape that she loves and today continues to cultivate Balinese artisans alongside innovative designers and architects with the goal of making Bali a global center for sustainable design and bringing those designs to the rest of the world. I first learned about Alora and the incredible work she's doing with Bamboo not too long ago. There is a series called Home on Apple TV+, and Season 1, Episode 3 is dedicated to her in this work. It's a phenomenal watch. I highly recommend it. And as soon as I watched, I knew I wanted to get her on and get her perspective on her life and the world and the work she's doing. And I know you're going to love this. Highlights include how Alora created her first structure when she was only nine years old, the Fairy Mushroom House, growing up in Bali with Canadian roots, the vision for green school in Bali, the beauty and sustainability of building with bamboo, and the deep need for inspiration and hope. I know you're definitely going to be inspired by hearing this episode, and I'd really appreciate it if you could help spread the good word, share this one with somebody in your life, and I thank you ahead of time. Without further ado, here I go with Alora Hardy. Alora, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Alora, we got tons to get into. You're doing some incredible work with your team over in Bali, and you're building these elaborate bamboo structures, but I want to start off talking about the first structure you had your hand in the creative process, and this was all the way back when you're nine years old. And you drew up the fairy mushroom house. So take us back there and set the scene. What was happening? So my family grew up in the little town of Ubud in Bali. And we were renting some bungalows on the edge of the rice fields for the first part of my childhood. So when I was about nine, my mom decided it was time to build our own house. And in doing so, she purchased this beautiful, steep riverside site and The style of homes in Bali is also very often that it's a series of pavilions, not just one big house. She chose the site for her master bedroom pavilion, and then the kitchen would be a little higher. And in between, she chose a terrace that would be the kid's house. And so she said, well, what do you want your house to look like? What do you want your and your brother's pavilion to be? And I was nine, and I was in the wonderland of the jungle here, basically, escaping into nature and fairy land. And so I drew a fairy mushroom house, like a traditional like storybook mushroom. And it had to have red polka dots, I said at the time, on the roof and a dormer window. <laughs> so what did your mom think when you drew this up? She got really worried because she was serious in giving me a say. And she got really stressed actually about like, how would she execute this? How would she actually create something, get something built? that connected with my idea. And she also didn't want it to be something that I would hate a few years later when I was a teenager. (laughs) So she took it seriously. And I remember negotiating with her about it. I was like, no, no, they have to be red polka dots, mom. You could like put big boulders up there to make the polka dots. And she was like, okay, well, honey, we'll, we'll figure this out. But by the time she had gotten the building process in motion and saved up the money to do it, it was a couple years later, I think I was like 11. And I was on board for making a big, basically a a bamboo dome structure, similar to a traditional rice hut, but kind of rounded on the edges. 
And my mom always remembers how the builders, like the craftsmen who were actually building it, got really excited about figuring out a new technique to make this kind of dome work. And we covered it with thatch, which is a local, often used roofing material. And I got that dormer window. Originally, I wanted two of them to fit on the site. So one for me and one for my brother, but it it didn't fit at all. So I got the upstairs and my brother got the downstairs. He was like three or four at the time. (laughs) And we made ourselves a little house. So what did your brother feel about all this? At the time, I think it was all just exciting. And I painted a big dragon mural to go over his bed. So I think he really liked that. Later on, I went off to boarding school and he got the upstairs. So I think that worked out pretty well. I think we just didn't really know it was it was that unusual. We just were like, here's our house. We got to help make it. And that's the way it was. Well, we're going to get to boarding school. But first, I actually want to go all the way back to your childhood And you weren't born in Bali. You're actually born over in Canada in the Toronto area. So take us back there and talk about what life was like at that point. My mom grew up in Kleinberg, Ontario with eight brothers and sisters. She was the oldest. And they went on a family trip to Cancun in the early 70s. And she kept going. She said, see you guys, I'm going backpacking. And she disappeared for several weeks in. Mexico. And one day she met another traveler who said, Penny, that sounds familiar. And there was a like an ad in the paper. The embassy put an ad in the paper saying, Penny Burton, please call home. <laughs> so she did call home and she did go home. But within a couple of years, she and my dad struck out around the world. And by the time I was born in Toronto in, in 81, she and dad had already kind of settled in Bali and they just came home to have me. Gotcha. So your earliest memories would be what? I must have been like four and my mom's cousin was visiting and she was a ballet dancer and we walked through the muddy path on the way to the rice fields and she just, I remember her being so excited about the mud and I was like, oh, mud, hmm, right, let's notice that. Based on like when she came to Bali, I think that might be the youngest one. So what initially brought your parents to Bali? I don't think they thought they were coming to Bali. They were just traveling to a bunch of different countries. They bought a round-the-world flight that let you stop in a certain number of countries. And Bali, I think they say, is way too touristy. So they just kind of stopped here for a minute on their way to more wild and remote places. But they just ended up magnetized back to Bali. And it took a long time for them to relate to maybe living here. They were just traveling and trading and making. Like They figured out pretty early on that they could have ideas and, and find craftsmen and get things made and trade them or sell them with other travelers. So when you're five months old and and your parents and you moved to Bali, at this point, did they know they were setting up base there for for long term? I think that kind of galvanized it. Suddenly you have a baby. I mean, my dad talks about a moment of terror, (laughs) seeing me, this little creature, and like, how how are you going to provide? If you're just a couple in the artistic wanderings of life, it's one thing. But I think at that point, they were like, oh, okay, so what are we really going to do? It prompted them to like find strategies for how to like make a living and have some roots. So what did that look like? What did they do for work when they settled in? So originally, there were a lot of different things that they did. They were, and not all of them in Bali for a while, they were um, they were buying like antique silk kimono in the markets in Japan and like selling them, doing shows and selling them in Toronto, like a pop-up shop, basically, it would be considered now. They did that a little bit with wood carvings and handicrafts in Bali in the early days. Um, some of the things that you still see in the markets in Bali are things that they designed. By the time I was little, they had really settled into a groove with some gold and silver smiths based in what is ironically Kuta Beach, which is a really like beachy, like pretty tacky, like part of the tourist world of Bali at the moment. But it happens to have been like one of the villages most expert in gold. In Bali. So we would walk the back alleys of Kuta visiting the different silversmiths and goldsmiths. And I don't know if people realize, but most jewelry is like now made from like cast wax and then you can duplicate it. But when you're talking about gold and silversmithing, you're actually kind of chiseling and chipping away at like a lump of metal and then torching it and softening it and then carving it. So they were making one of a kind pieces for those early years, really kind of sculptural works of art. And as a kid, coming from Canada. I know you don't have any memory from being in Canada, but did you feel accepted and embraced in the Balinese culture? Um, I was blonde. 
So I didn't exactly fit in. And there were like a fraction of the tourists. And there were like two or three other not Indonesian kids in Ubud in the very beginning. And then the spattering more over the decade, right? But it was definitely not fitting in. And it was also like definitely like very much at home and like in love with the landscape and going off to the temple. You're totally welcome. There wasn't any sense of being shut out. It was just like maybe a little bit celebrity-ish, a little bit. There's that blonde kid who lives over the hill, right? Like there she is. Um, <laughs> like we know who that is. A sense of being noticed in that way, being different. But I felt like I belonged here. And then I would go back to Canada every few years. We'd go back and see our family and grandparents and cousins. And I definitely didn't belong there either. But I felt like that was my family and there was connection there. And what was that like having such a culture shock, you know, going from Bali to Canada and at a young age like that and just seeing such a different lifestyle? What kind of impact did that have on you? I mean, it was consistent since like before I can remember. So I think it was just part of the rhythm. It was fun. It was like, oh, we're going to see snow this time. Can I please watch TV when we're there? <laughs> um, things like that. And it was harder, I guess, in teen years of moving, like moving to the West and missing Bali. But I mean, I, I remember coming back from Canada after being there for a few months and like trying to remember the Balinese word for cow, because you sort of turn your whole mind over. I don't know if you know the term third culture kids, but there's a lot there's a lot of people in the world who actually grow up in a place that's different than the culture of one or more of their parents. Like my husband, Rajiv, was born in India, raised in the US, and has that like similar third culture kid perspective on the world, even though he was going in the opposite direction. I think there's a whole series of interesting connections that we have, those of us who like have those different collage of backgrounds and places and experiences. I see what you're saying. And you mentioned coming over to Canada and getting excited about the TV. What was home life like when you were a kid? Did you have electricity in the home or what was that like? So in Ubud, we had, I don't know what year we got what thing, but I remember the ice man coming, like the truck with blocks of ice on the back. Then they drop it off on the doorstep and you'd put it in the wooden chest. And eventually we got a refrigerator that plugged in. I remember lots of oil lamps in the early days. I remember my parents like deciding to invest in a fax machine. And I remember saying like, oh, this is such a drag. It's just going to be another thing that keeps breaking and you're going <laughs> to keep having to fiddle with it. I remember we'd get phone calls from Canada and we didn't have a phone yet. So the hotel across the street would literally shout like they would just scream, John Penny. And like we'd go running down and it would take like a minute or two to get down and across the street to the hotel. And I think it was like a dollar a minute to make a phone call. So it was like tick and clock, like, okay, let's say hi. And then I can only imagine how strange it was for the families back home to like try to have to like go through these hurdles to even reach out to us and connect with us off in the jungle. That's so funny. So you mentioned going away to school. You ended up at age 14 going to school in the U.S. Was this welcome for you at the time or did you just find it was a necessity to get the education you wanted? So English speaking education was not available past grade seven when I was in grade seven. So it was kind of a requirement. It was past grade six. For grade seven, I did like seven and eight. I did homeschooling, but like in an extra classroom at school with like two friends. So it was really clear that I had to go off. I was really also restless too. I really wanted to go out in the world. I mean, my parents had also gotten divorced like by that time. So I was also sort of like unsettled and just like needing to find my own ground. So at 14, going off to school was really inevitable. And a lot of friends had already left by then to go off to different parts of the world. I almost went to India. I almost went to a school with no electricity in India that was like a really cool school for international students. But then my stepmom found literally like a mail order book of like international boarding schools. She found an art school that was like, you get to do half the day in fine arts or drama or dance or whatever art you choose to major in for high school. And so I got a scholarship there and was just really excited to go. And what were you planning on doing when you finished? I didn't know how to plan anything, but I knew that I had grown up super artistic and everything around me suggested that just having a life involved in all sorts of art forms was just a very natural part of things. And so to go to an art school seemed really obvious. And I was great at academics and that was all fine. So I knew I could balance it. And suddenly I was there with like 
people who've been studying ballet since they were two and like moody painters and like graffiti people like and all kinds of different people who are really like into something i think that's not necessarily common for high school age for teenage to be like everyone's devoted to something and really investing time in it so that was amazing so when you completed that did you stay over in the u.s or did you go back to bali for a bit no i was on the like must get into good school and study something to plan important career kind of mindset right But I think it took until about the end of high school, of art school, to realize that I had totally misdefined art. I thought that art was something that can happen as part of daily life. And fine arts really isn't, or at least wasn't then. It was very much like, a okay, well, you can like get your portfolio together and you can like approach galleries and you can build an identity that way and be in a very like intellectual conversation. I got really into that and critique and like, but I couldn't relate to just working in one medium. And I couldn't relate to having my window into the world or my work's relationship to the world happening in the context of a gallery. So for my senior show, I literally bought, like I ordered a pile of bamboo poles, kind of ironically, there was no significance to bamboo at that time. It was just seemed like a good thing to use. I set them up, I draped rough raw cotton. I set them up in a spiral and like kind of wrapped it in bamboo. And then I used that as my gallery. I got permission not to have it in the actual gallery, but I put up like and I made pedestals and I put sculptures and, and drawings and all kinds of things up, like out in the field. Like that's where they needed to be. I just couldn't like put the stuff I'd made inside of a room. It didn't make sense. And how do people respond to that? I mean, I just think it was really fun and novel. I don't remember any major deal about it, but it was great. But then by that point, I was sort of on the track of like having researched art schools and going up to art school. And it was a bit of a disconnect because I don't want to be in the art world, but I wanted more training. And I also didn't want too much more training because I thought I'd just been through four years of high school and already like had covered all the basics and art schools have a foundation year where you cover all the basics. So I was really kind of resisted that. And I kind of cornered myself into like finding a fine art school that was associated with a really good university, but where you could do exactly what you wanted and no one would tell you what to do. And so I ended up kind of at loose ends in that kind of a unstructured program. Okay. And what happened next? Well, When you go to college and everyone is a moody artist and avoiding each other in the hallways and you're not required to go to any class and there's no continuity of a group, you can't actually find anywhere to connect. It's like the perfect recipe for like not connecting. And as much as you also identify as a moody artist at 19, you also like need that. You also need a tribe. You need a structure. And I I found some excellent moments of teaching with certain teachers and kind of navigated my way through like seeking out like professors, but it was totally strange. And I was in a big city for the first, not that big a city. I was in Boston and sort of on my own in an apartment. And it was just like very odd. And how did you end up connecting with Donna Karen? Well, by the time I'd gone through art school at the university, I also studied a lot of anthropology in the end and really loved that. But I knew that I wasn't going to be academic and I knew that I wasn't going to be an artist. And so I'd figured out that actually the category is called design. It was just really a case of who do we know who's doing something in the design world? And like Donna had been in Bali and met dad here. And so he was like, meet Donna and ask for her advice. And I ended up actually getting the task of painting for her for an upcoming collection. She went, you're an artist, you can paint. Here's some very expensive, precious Italian silk jersey. <laughs> you go for it. This is kind of talked about what she wanted. And how did all that work out? It was a bit weird because that wasn't a position or a job description that existed within the big corporate entity that she was a part of, but I somehow sort of got it to be a job anyway and ended up within that organization for like five years. At first, literally painting on fabrics and then like creating the duplicates and then figuring out how to put them into computer programs to send them to be printed in the factories and then doing whatever was needed graphically, visually kind of the opposite of coming from an arts background, because it was all entirely supposed to be at the service of and with the feeling of the brand and not of like one's own personal idea of anything. But it was really interesting because you're translating the conversation that's going on with the art director and the fashion team. And Donna speaks in a really creative, artistic way. So it was just kind of like trying to intuit and like read what that was and turn it into something visual. And while you're going through that and doing that work, did you love it at the time? It was really exciting. There was so much to learn. And I 
I don't know if I loved it. I kind of loved the rush of it. I was like proud of being in New York and like having stuff out there in the world. But like eventually I just felt really at odds with creating stuff that was so time-based necessarily. Fashion is like seasonal. And I got the bug. I would buy a dress and I could only wear it for a few months before it just felt so wrong. And it's just like, it's not so much a strategic thing. It's really an instinctual, like artistic process thing that happens in the design team. You're just like, Ooh, like you couldn't possibly wear like that tone this month. And you really need that one and the shape and the drape and all of those things. It does have like really deep artistic roots, like just sensing what feels right. And when that's done right, it results in like super successful fashion collections because they're catching something that's in the water, that's in the air that people also feel. And it either matches up with what people have been craving or people jump on board with it because they see something true in it. So there's something about that that was amazing. While you were there, do you remember having an epiphany moment where you realized this just isn't for me? I have to find a way out and figure something out? I mean, part of it was structural. Part of it was like you get two weeks vacation a year and you're not allowed to take two weeks at once unless you get an exception because your home is like a 36 hour plane ride away, which I did. So I'd get to come home and I'd only use that time to come home to Bali because I missed it and craved it. And I just felt like I've managed to get to be part of making stuff, designing and making stuff and having them be out in the world, out there in the big city. Like I'd achieved that. But on one of the trips back to Bali, I saw the, the documentary by William McDonough called The Next Industrial Revolution. And as a kid, I had books around. My parents were pretty conscious about all of this. And I think in the 80s, there was a certain amount of conversation emerging about it. But like 50 things kids can do to save the earth, how to reuse toilet rolls for something, just little practical tips. So I'd always sort of been programmed that way a little bit, but then it was much more overridden by like ambition and like needing to do something in the world and but those things started to rub up against each other. And I couldn't see a way in, in fashion or in any other emerging fashion company that I could even get a hold of anyone in, in New York. So I couldn't see a way to move into a field that was sustainable. And it felt possible because the next industrial revolution just talks about how it's not about being a little less bad and reducing and reusing and recycling. It's about how to like design things where the materials stay valuable or these sort of circular systems. It just sparked something in me. I thought, okay, now I can connect. Now it's possible to go there. So while you were in New York, I believe you met your husband in a yoga class? Yes. I walked into a yoga class and I said, is this a joke? Are we filming a Bollywood movie here? He is so handsome. He is tall and Indian and graceful. And like, I just stared at him the whole class. (laughs) So you guys hit it off. And how close was this to the end of your stint in New York? Well, that was really early on. I'd say I spent the first six months in New York partying with the other intern and burned out on that. And then within a few months, I met Rajiv. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Alora to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. Enhance your energy and increase your antioxidant intake with Organifi Red Juice. This superfood punch is delicious and incredibly easy to make. You just mix a scoop of the powder with some filtered water, give it a stir or shake, and it's ready to go. And clean up is a cinch. With the Organifi Red Juice, you get cordyceps, rhodiola, Siberian ginseng, reishi mushroom, acai, beets, and an array of berries and pomegranate all in one. I bet now you can understand why it tastes so good. I love the whole Organifi lineup of products, but if I could only choose one, this would be it. It's my favorite. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase, by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Increase your immunity and boost your energy with this superfood punch from Organifi. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Paleo Valley. The superfood bars from Paleo Valley are crafted with 10 organic, nutrient-dense superfoods, plus grass-fed bone broth protein. Bone broth is rich in collagen, which is the most abundant protein in our bodies, and is found in bones, muscles, skin, blood vessels, tendons, and the digestive system. Traditional diets contain much larger amounts of collagen than the standard diet of today, but Paleo Valley is helping bring it back. Collagen has been shown to ease joint discomfort, improve skin health and elasticity, 
and it contains amino acids that protect cardiovascular health. The bone broth protein is sourced from healthy grass-fed cows that are raised on pesticide-free grass pastures. The cows are never fed GMO grains, or any grains for that matter. They come in two flavors, dark chocolate chip and apple cinnamon, the latter being my favorite. And if you haven't already, be sure and go back and listen to episode 371 with the co-founder of Paleo Valley, Autumn Smith. You'll learn all about how legit this company is and how they compromise on nothing. You'll also hear her amazing journey of healing from IBS and anxiety. And as the listener of the show, you get 15% off your Paleo Valley purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash paleovalley. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash paleovalley. Get yourself some of the dark chocolate chip or apple cinnamon superfood bars from Paleo Valley, or even better, give them both a try. And now back to my chat with Alora. So when did you know coming back to Bali was going to be in the cards for you? I didn't know until soon before I did it. I really thought that like I needed the next job and I just couldn't even figure out how to look for it. Honestly, sustainable fashion in New York in um, 2009 was like tiny little things that weren't necessarily going to hire anyone. So I just couldn't figure it out. I felt like I was pretty depressive at that point. I was like, I just needed to find a way to participate in the world in a way that felt like part of the future. I knew that things had to be done differently. And what year was it that your dad started green school? So dad and Cynthia, his wife, they had been restless about schools for a while because my two sisters are like 14 and 18 years younger than me. So they were restless and they had just sold their stake in their jewelry company and they are not chill people. So they just needed to be doing something exciting and creative. So they dove headfirst. They built an entire campus. I'm talking like 40 structures, or maybe it was like 20 or 30 when it was first built, but like they built a whole world and kind of committed to bamboo because they had decided that it should be a very green school. And bamboo was just like the only material that could just really easily qualify for them. So even reclaimed timber is a cool thing, right? But it doesn't speak to the future because you can use it all up. Bamboo, you can grow and then use within like four years and then grow more of, and then grow more of, and then if everyone needed it, like you could just grow it. And there was this bounty to that, that just like set the bar. So within a couple of years, they had created an entire school and there were like, I don't know, 70 students the first year. Wow. That's incredible. And how did they first get turned on to bamboo specifically? My dad says that his old friend, Linda Garland had been ranting at him about bamboo for several years by then. And he was a woodman and he loved his big rainforest timber, but she finally got to him. And then he jumped in. She had been researching natural bamboo treatment methods and like popularizing it in design. And she was really a pioneer in that. So was the school, the initial infrastructure built when you were in New York doing your thing there? Yeah. I literally like came back for one of those two week vacations and I was like, wait, what are you doing? What's this building? (laughs) So when you come back, like there's this team that's been obviously put together and they've built all this infrastructure for the school. And what point is it that you come back and how do you connect with that team? So I took a very controversial unpaid leave from my job, which upset everyone because you're not supposed to bend the rules, but I took it. I went on a speaking engagement in Japan with my dad to a university there because he was going around speaking about bamboo and speaking about the green school. And then we came to Bali briefly and something in that just gave me the extra confidence to be able to like take the leap. And a few months after that, I resigned from my job and came back to Bali. My husband, he wasn't my husband yet, but he had started med school in New Jersey. So he wasn't even like in the city full time anymore. So I was like, ah, he's moved to Jersey. I might as well just move to Bali. <laughs> so, so I did. So initially he stayed back and finished his schooling? Uh, he's still there. <laughs> he's, we're still back and forth. But he was like gotcha. in full time school. So I moved to Bali with the commitment to go back there like for two weeks every two months or something. I see. So how did things get rolling when you got back to Bali and you met with the team? And how did everything get sparked? So there was like 120 people working together, sort of post green school's main construction, kind of trying to find jobs just to let them continue doing this. And so they had like signed a house or two or three at Green Village, which is a piece of land nearby. They broke ground on the first house like a month after I got here. And so 
it was that. And I was like, oh, I want to learn from my dad. He's doing amazing things. He's such a visionary. I just want the chance to like follow him around and maybe I can help translate. I have some skills. I don't have any building skills or anything like that, but I have, I grew up in Bali. I know how things are done. I speak the language. I can just be useful. That's what I thought I was doing. And how did your background in design come into play? I just had a very clear confidence in what works compositionally, texturally. And I had stayed so general in art school. I had like refused to like devote myself to one art form to the point where I could just connect with and work with any material I felt. So how quickly coming back and setting up with the team, did you become the creative director? I became the owner within a few months because my dad just decided that he needed to go on vacation. <laughs> and so he just he just said, here you go, deal with it. Okay. Well, let's go through the process. Let's take this from the top and talk about bamboo and get into the nitty gritty. Let's talk about what happens, how long you've already touched on, I believe, how long it takes to harvest. But once you harvest the wood, how does the whole processing work? Okay. So let's start from a seedling. You plant a seedling. You probably don't even have to plant it. It probably just showed up among the weeds on a slope of a riverbank. And it gets away with growing because no one's going to farm that steep riverbank. And it's lucky because it's Bali or it's many parts of the world and there's like enough rain or a spring nearby. And it loves water and it starts to shoot. Now, within five years, you have an established clump. And that clump is sending up a new generation of shoots every year. And so from then on, every year, you can harvest the poles that are three to four years old. Okay. And then you don't have to water it and you don't have to do anything to it and you don't have to replant it. That clump will last for a lifetime-ish, depending on the species. And you can, you can optimize it and cultivate it. But the bamboo that we use in Bali, much of it is just sort of growing on people's land in areas that are not useful for much else, living off of sunlight and rainwater and just turning into, in our case, these like 12 centimeter to 15 centimeter poles up to like 18 meters of usable length. It's just the crazy expression of like bounty. And you guys also work with people in Bali too as well, right? Where you go in and use their land to grow bamboo and in turn, it provides them with finances. Well, we don't, but lots of people grow it and, and want to sell it. And so we choose carefully and we buy it. Okay, well, let's talk about processing. Once you cut the stalk and bamboo is actually grass. So once you cut that and bring it to the factory, what's the next step? Well, you cut it and then you drag it up out of a river valley. So it's very convenient that it's very light because like two to three men can lift it. You have to navigate it onto a truck and then like down tiny mountain roads <laughs> to get to the factory. Imagine these 18 meter poles going down like little windy roads, right? And once it gets here, you need to dry it out for a minute. You need to treat it. We treat it in a natural salt solution that's related to borax treatment. There's variations of this that people are using around the world. And what that does is it gets the salt in and the sap out. It's a grass, right? It's a big, sweet grass. And that sap will attract insects unless you can make it salty enough. So once it's salty enough, the salt stays in there forever, and it will never be eaten by insects. And that's what gives us this timber that we can count on to build like a hundred year house. Now, that pole is an amazing, strong thing. Just the way that it's engineered by nature, it has incredible compressive strength. And it's this kind of beautiful, elegant pole. But from there, the task is to like design in a way that really works for it to create whatever you want to create structures. And, and then if you split it up, it's not like planing a piece of wood, it's hollow. So when you split it up, you get these very irregular shaped things that then you have to figure out what to do with, whittle them down and weave them. Or some people crush them up and turn them into a composite laminate timber situation so that it's more controllable and like easy to work with in the way that wood is. But we veer more on the opposite end, expressing it, like splitting it up in different ways and winding it or weaving it or bundling it or using the poles intact. And these structures you're building actually are basically 100% bamboo. You're including it to create the doors, the furniture inside, the bathroom inside, pretty much everything. Which is insane. And that's what we've done for most of the past decade. But it's been amazing because we really took a stand and we couldn't find hardly any other materials that you could consider sustainable to anywhere approaching the degree that bamboo is. And if we did, we didn't necessarily have someone who knew how to work well with it. So it would complicate things. So we just keep falling back on bamboo. To the extent that like, sometimes if you need like a ceiling, right? Plywood would be just a really convenient thing, sheetrock. We ruled all of those things out and stayed really purist for a long time. 
it's kind of like in art school, you are only allowed to draw with black and white at first. You can draw with black pastel or black chalk or black pencil, but you're not allowed to touch color until you really get those things that you learn from the contrast and the simplicity of black and white nails. So I sort of I sort of relate to it like that. Because now we're really branching out and connecting in other materials, which is really challenging, but has so many opportunities. So that's really the next step. So when you got back to Bali and you started to really get in and develop these structures, was that primarily in the Green Village? At first, much of our work was at the Green Village. At one point, I had four unique homes in process along the ridge of Green Village. And like Monday, I'd spend a few hours at one. Tuesday, I'd check on the other and go through it like that. So it was like full-time Green Village. At other times, we've had projects in other parts of Bali and then more and more so in other parts of the world. So there's a few things that we've built where none of us have even been there to see it. Like we literally created it such that it could go in a container and be assembled on site. Talk more about Green School. It opened all the way back in 2008. How has it evolved over the years? And talk about the proximity to the Green Village. So Green School and Green Village are like a short walk from each other, like maybe a 10 minute walk through the forest. It was initially like Green Village was sort of thought to be an extension of the community that Green School was meant to be the hub of. Dad and Sin always, I think, imagined Green School to be the center of a new experience that was more than just a school, of a new place, of a new community, of a new set of priorities. And so Green Village was initially an extension to that. Pretty soon, it actually turned out that some people who bought there would have their kids in the school. Other people just bought a house at Green Village because they wanted one. They needed one. Like they saw it and they were like, that connects so deeply in some way with some emotional, like, and if they were in a position to buy a second or a third home, they might just do that. And sometimes they would do it without really consulting with their spouse and without like being here. So there were all sorts of complexities that came up with it, but it was really like an emotional, I think what they were feeling is that's what the world needs to look like. Like I need to be a part of that. One early client literally saw it as like investing in something. He wanted the house to be a chance for us to create what we could do next. And then that became Sharma Springs. So that really worked out. It was much more in the artistic innovation purpose than it was in connecting with the Green School community in the end. Partly that was the price point. You had to have quite a high price to be able to handcraft suddenly everything out of a material that hadn't been worked with in that way before. And we were able to command at least an equivalent to other like moderately luxurious houses. We were always playing with like, how can we do this? How can we afford to do this? Really much more in the field of investing in innovation, but oops, it's a business kind of structure. And I don't have a background in business, so I don't even know how to speak to that. But it always felt like we were doing it for the sake of the art form continuing and how to connect that with it being a house and people needing to live in it and enjoy it. And when it comes to green school, how many kids are attending each year? Oh, well, that, that's changed a lot over the years. I don't know. I think it was like 70 something the first year. It got up to like 500 and something last year. And now the world is upside down. So I don't know the numbers, but they're making it work. The thing that's happened in the meantime is actually that there are green schools starting in other parts of the world. There's a green school in New Zealand that's already opened. Green school Tulum in Mexico is next. Green school South Africa is under construction. And then there's a bunch of other ones in the works. So it's become more than a Bali thing and it's become more than a bamboo thing. And how does the new school go about starting? Obviously, it all started in Bali. How does somebody go about starting another school? Is there Does it have to go through like your dad and his ways or how, how would that work? There's a support office for it. I'm not really sure on the details of how you'd compare. It's like sort of a licensing process. The design process is what I'm mostly involved in, in like creating the flow of the campus and like considering what materials and collaborating with the local architects and builders on how to make it a green school without it necessarily looking like the green school in Bali or being made with bamboo, depending on the location, it really varies. So I'm in the space creation and keeping the philosophy and what's possible coming through for those different places. When it comes to the specific education taking place at green school, how is it different? My experience of it as the mother of a five-year-old who's in kindergarten is that they learn through experiencing nature. In the early years, especially, I see that they are finding a sense of connection and belonging and obviously like learning letters and numbers, but in a way that is like interwoven with like planting rice or planning how to make a shed for the pigs or building something together. Like it's a very hands-on, a very nature-based 
And I think I heard in a podcast of yours recently that, that that's also measured in science, that if you learn by planting vegetable gardens, there's like a 15% higher retention rate. Yeah, that might have been in the Kimball Musk episode. Kimball, yeah. And I heard that and I was like, okay, well, we're on the right track. <laughs> but I'm sure that the school itself has studied and, and it can articulate all that better. But I'm sort of part of the choir. I'm preaching to the choir, so I'm just in. Well, one of the things I love most about the structures you're creating is how integrated they are with nature and the open concepts. So when you're in there, you're one with nature. I'm assuming that's very intentional with the way you're creating these. But how top of priority is that when you're when you're designing a, a new space? So it comes from going back to the early houses at Green Village, just a love of the land. I love Bali. I really missed it when I was away, especially like the landscape of it, like the terraces. The way that the landscape is in Bali is, I think it needs to be acknowledged that it's not just pure nature. It's not just wilderness. It's all been curated. It's all been farmed and gardened and in the most extreme and beautiful cases, terraced into rice fields with complex irrigation systems that go back 2000 years of arranging how to cascade the water from like the mountain lakes down through the fields instead of just through the rivers. So there is an engineering artistry amazingness that has happened there. By the way, that can be considered deforestation. When people first came to Bali and began to do farming, they deforested huge swaths of land and turned them into things that have great value as rice fields. They weren't always just rice fields, other crops were grown. But you see that evidence even on like the not rice fields that we built Green Village on. They're called ladang. They're sort of stretches of land that you can't quite get the water to. So you use those pieces of land for farming things that can rely on rainwater. So we were building on terrace ladang land. And it was actually very steep and undesirable to most types of building. It was also in an area that really wasn't considered useful yet because the Green School had just plopped itself down there. And there was really... Nothing else there beyond villages and some light industry. It wasn't like a tourist destination. It wasn't a residential hub for anything other than Balinese villages, really. And so there was this pristine in the way that humans have created it to suit their needs. Like it was garden. It was like kind of rambling back gardens that were terraced in a way steeply down to a river. When you're building on a cliff, typically you just figure out how loose it is, build a bunch of retaining walls to make sure it's safer than you need it to be. And that means pouring a whole lot of concrete. And my dad took the stand from the first moment. He chose this land and then he took the stand that there should be no concrete above ground level. Basically, that was the initial requirement. So yes, you have foundations, you dig deep in. Fortunately, the bedrock was like a meter down. So we could dig reasonable little foundations with some concrete, put a big river boulder on top of the foundation, drill a hole in it so the rebar could come up and go into the bamboo pole. Then you carve out the base of a bamboo pole, and that gives you the ankle that you need for what turned out to be up to six-story houses that we created. So we perched these things. We designed the houses specifically to fit into the existing contours of the land. This was very much an on-site exercise. What shape fits here well? Where do I want to stand on this terraced site? What perspective and outlook do I want? What do I need? Do I need to feel protected or opened outward and excited? And we really formed these spaces into the nooks of each little dip and bend in this whole steep situation. So we wanted to connect with that place. We loved that place. It was a beautiful place. We didn't want to reform it, reshape it, bulldoze it. In some cases, we had to in order to fit a swimming pool in and things like this. But for the most part, we really perched these designs into the existing landscape. And they were places where you already wanted to be. Like you wanted to sit on that slope overlooking the river. And many houses in Bali are open air. We weren't like so extreme and innovative in that way. There's a convention here, even in like modern villas, where often the living rooms are fully open air or open a bowl. The bedrooms are very likely to be air conditioned. So we followed that, except for some homes where the owners took a stand and said, no air conditioning. And so it varies per home. They're all unique. But yes, it's connecting with nature. It's connecting with the landscape. But I think that there's something that we miss that we almost always exclude when we talk about nature. And that's us. People, we're nature. Like we're part of nature. We were made by nature. And we have all sorts of independent thoughts and ideas about how things are and how in control we are. But in reality, what my father in law says is that we are nature looking back at itself. We are nature's consciousness. So, to that extent, we have a huge responsibility, which we are dismally failing at in almost all areas. 
<laughs> but on the other side of things, we recognize fundamentally that a setting that feels natural, that is made by humans in some alignment with the way nature does things has even more impact on us than being in the most beautiful forest. Because it proves to us, I think subconsciously at least, that humans are part of a beautiful natural world and future. When I walk into the buildings at Green School, especially the heart of school, it just leaves you with a sense of awe. And you can relate that awe to being in a forest or a canyon. But the fact that it's made by us and that it's made with care and alignment with what the material wants to do and what the shape of the land is, it just opens up this huge trap door in our minds of what could be and what the future could be that isn't stuck in a conversation of sustainability and restriction and guilt. That's beautiful. Anna Laura, do you personally live in a bamboo home that you built? Well, I have been at breakneck speed and not yet at the stage of like being able to build my own full home. But I adopted a beautiful wooden antique structure and I renovated it when my first son was born. And then when my daughter was born last year, I added another bamboo pavilion to it that's entirely bamboo. So inch by inch, I am finding a way into that. But actually, you know, that's not completely true because for the first five years I was here, right up until I got pregnant, I lived in a basket pod, one five meter diameter pod on the edge of a cliff. So I was absolutely immersed in the Kool-Aid at that point. (laughs) Coming from the big city, did you find getting immersed in nature had a positive impact on your well-being right away? There were a lot of mornings I would wake up and say, like, if I weren't waking up here looking out at this view with that sunlight streaming in and the breeze on my skin, I would not be able to get up and go to work. Because it's been hard, right? It's been intense. And that has fed me so much. And like we talked about with the structures being so open and connected to nature, are there a lot of predators or bugs that you have to worry about coming into the buildings while you're in there? (laughs) So the CBC or the, was it CBS or CBC? I can't remember. I think both have been here, but one of them came and did a film, did a segment, and we chose a nice friendly owner who was excited to be interviewed. And he literally pointed out the ants, like crawling up the column, these little tiny black ants crawling up the column. And he's like, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he's like, listen, if I get to experience all of this and the light and the breeze and the beauty around me, and it means I need to share the space with a few ants crawling by, like, I'm good. I'm good. Like, he's happy to have that connection to nature in exchange for a few ants. Now, sometimes there are a lot of mosquitoes. And so you need to balance a house. You need to create spaces within a structure so that you can be protected. We humans are soft, little, fuzzy creatures, and we are not that adept to actually living in the jungle. So we need to design with that in mind and create the right amount of shelter. But the reflex, the default has become to entirely box and seal ourselves off. So we miss out on all the good stuff. And we are in control and we feel good about control. Usually we like to be in charge and to be able to control things around us and to press a remote to have the temperature adjust by a millimeter. But to the extent and in the times and in the parts of the structure and the space where you can let go of that, there's so much to get back. There's so many gifts that you get. So you need to balance. You need both. What about bigger animals like monkeys and different things in the jungle? Do they ever come in and and scare the people? There's definitely a story or two about a monkey or a snake sneaking in here and there. Monkey tribes don't tend to like to hang out around people except when, when one of the guys gets kicked out of the group. But actually at my place, I had a monkey once and it turned out to be an escaped pet from my neighbor not even a wild monkey. So (laughs) there's all sorts of different kinds of risks in the jungle. I had mentioned to you before we hit record that my wife and I went to Bali for our honeymoon, which was just such a beautiful experience back in 2018. And I just remember going and doing the hike, the morning hike at Mount Batur. And of course, I'm sure that's a very touristy thing to do. We just loved it. And seeing the monkeys was part of the descent to that hike. And I guess that's why I had monkey on the brain. Yeah, well, I mean, come and do that hike now and you can have the mountain to yourself. It's a great time to visit. Yeah, well, let's talk more about that. How has Corona COVID-19 impacted tourism and everything going on in Bali? So everything tourist related is ground to a halt. There are some restaurants and cafes that can get enough business from those of us that live here or people who got stuck here, either by design or by accident. So there's a certain number of foreigners around buying fancy cappuccinos and keeping those places in business. There's a certain number of domestic tourism happening from across Indonesia, but like compared to 
what was expected and counted on up until March, like it's just mind blowing. I don't even know how to talk about the numbers or the percentages, but like a very significant majority of income was coming from jobs or entrepreneurship related to tourism. And it's just absolutely evaporated. And in spite of that, the level of sort of calm and acceptance, but it's really surprising that that extent of change could happen and that there aren't riots and upset and upheaval and chaos going on. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Alora to give a shout out to our show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. The propolis spray from Beekeepers is a high potency extract, so you can enjoy the full immunity of the hive with just a few sprays. It's a daily immune support on the go that has a sweet honey-like taste. Bees use antioxidant-rich propolis, which is a sticky collection of plant and tree resins, to line the walls of the hive to protect against microscopic foreign invaders. They even have some at the entrance to ensure that bees don't track in any unwanted germs. We love this propolis spray. It's been a staple in our home for years. For bulletproof immunity, you take three to four sprays of propolis one or two times a day. And during periods of increased stress or fatigue, you up that to four or five sprays of propolis up to five times a day. And as a listener of the show, you get 15% off your beekeeper's purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. On top of that, if you spend $60 or more, you get free shipping. Support your immune system daily with the propolis spray from beekeepers. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Perfect Keto. Looking to support ketosis? The exogenous ketone base from Perfect Keto does just that. They're the best tasting BHB exogenous ketones on the market. They're completely clean, no artificial sweeteners or junk, and are sweetened with monk fruit for balanced sweetness. They come in five flavors, chocolate, peach, coffee, vanilla, and salted caramel. Or if you'd prefer capsules, they come in a two-pack of unflavored capsules as well. They're great for providing energy in the mornings or during an afternoon slump, and they can also be used to help curb your appetite during intermittent fasting. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your order by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Perfect Keto products ship worldwide, and you get free shipping if you live in the U.S. and you spend over $29. Give yourself an energy boost when you need it with Perfect Keto's exogenous ketone base. And now back to my chat with Alora. Well, being someone who grew up in Bali and, and was there since I think it was 1981, how has, aside from Corona, how has tourism changed over the years? I want to say that, I mean, it's just been like a very, very steep acceleration for tourism in Bali. And even as a kid, I remember someone would visit who had been there two years before and they were like, oh no, I can't even bear to walk down the street. Bali has been ruined. Everything is so much more crowded. And I'm like, you're here too. You're part of that crowd. So own it, right? And yet they would come back again and it was never quite ruined. And I think that there are journals of travelers coming here in the 30s saying how it's already been ruined. So there's this absurd conversation really of like a place is pure and beautiful and pristine. And there's, especially if there's culture to be seen there, that it must stay as it is and that it must be preserved and that it will be ruined when seen. But in fact, everything is in evolution and everything is changing. And there is a lot of opportunity and possibility happening because what I've really noticed more and more lately since I've been back, what I've been heartened by in the context of that sort of onslaught of people and of growth, what I'm encouraged by is seeing the significant level and number of artistic and some sustainable and high quality and design and craft connected projects that happen from here. That does overlap also into health. There's like, there's a big piece of Bali and especially Ubud where I grew up that is to do with health and well-being and self-development, self-growth, almost to a comical degree. Of course, Eat, Pray, Love was here and then suddenly everything was a yoga studio and then uh, some sort of crazy fasting situation around every back road. But like, that's kind of positive. I think there's a swinging around that happens in the balancing of things. But it's like, it's great to see that as opposed to just straight up, like came to see a beach tourism. And there's a lot of beaches in the world, but Bali has something precious and everywhere has something precious. But what I see precious in Bali can really connect in with like, with making something beautiful possible. I'm here because of that. Like my parents got stuck here and fell in love with it because of that. Like you could have an idea, you can connect with existing skill and cultivate it and complement it with technology and create a whole new world. 
you mentioned Ubud, and that's where we spent quite a bit of our time when we were on our honeymoon. And yeah, there's- Oh, good. You're one of the smart ones. <laughs> there's just such a great energy there for sure. But there was also this feel that I talked about where it was like we weren't necessarily having a deep Bali experience where it was really touristy and, and it was almost like things had been carved out and created in the restaurants and the yoga studios, like you said, for the tourists coming in. So if I ever, and I do hope to go back someday, I want to make sure I explore more of the island and take more of, you know, off the beaten path and make that more of the experience. But it was beautiful. And I think back to the, the special time we had there all the time. Yeah, like anywhere you go, there's a layer of what has been set up for you to just see passively, right? And that's very much tied into what people are interpreting that travelers and tourists want and need. And so a lot of it's just reactive like that. But there's also an undercurrent and a deeper layer of proactive creation of something different that people didn't know they were looking for necessarily. And so I guess Instagram has been really big in that to a silly extent with like selfies on swings. But um the people that I interact with who travel in Bali are the ones who like found my family hotel, like Bamboo Inda, and just feel like they are in on something and like they found something off that track. And that people that come in, I mean, we really didn't want factory tours. We didn't want to deal with tourists knocking at the gate, but like it was kind of unavoidable. And then it was really kind of wonderful to see that people just want to see how things are made. They want to see new ways of doing things. They want to be inspired. My brother has created a course called Bamboo U and people fly from around the world. Well, not this week, but People were flying from around the world to take these 10-day workshops and understand how this is done. Not necessarily, sometimes, but not necessarily because they're going to go home and build with bamboo. But they realize that there's something going on. There's something to learn from this material and from these ways of doing things. I think people are going to be more invested in traveling for the purpose of a unique experience and perhaps for an actual experience, like a learning experience beyond just visiting, absorbing, taking, this is my holiday, I get to lie on the beach. I think it's going to be a, a shift in perspective. I hope it's going to be for people coming in the future. And Alora, how has your life changed since being featured on the Apple TV Plus special, the show Home, your episode three, Bali, and, and the work you're doing? How has that shifted everything for you? I mean, I don't think it's shifted anything. I just am so proud that I have it to see. It's amazing to have your own story told so beautifully by such a talented team of filmmakers with good intention. Like just that that exists as for my own memories is like an amazing thing. I haven't yet seen how it ripples out on the world because it's happened in parallel with this craziness of Corona. So I don't know that we know that yet, but I'm really encouraged by it in getting to see it myself. I get some space to reflect on what's meaningful and how it all connects and like what's possible. I get like a whole lot of like messages online of people who are inspired. And what's curious and so important is that it is inspiration that can affect and be applicable outside of the jungle, outside of this material, outside of the tropics. I hope that what we're doing can impact what people choose to use and make and buy. And like, I don't know, I, I hope that it has a big ripple effect in a subtle way like that. Well, let's talk more about that. I know over here in North America, there's quite a bit of bamboo clothing that seems to be gaining a lot of momentum, bamboo flooring. Outside of Bali and your part of the world, what do you hope to see happen with bamboo and its influence across the world? I don't know if it's about bamboo. I think that bamboo has just been an incredible guide for me and for us and for our process and has the opportunity to demonstrate to the world a possibility that has the chance to shift the conversation in the way that materials are related to the way that things are made, the way that spaces are planned, and the way fundamentally that we see ourselves in relation to and as part of or in opposition to nature. The structures that we make, when at their best, are an expression of what's possible from that material woven with like human imagination. There's a sense that like maybe we just drew a beautiful shape and then forced the bamboo to do that because that's what we do with most materials. You like you keep in mind the limitations perhaps of like that gauge of steel or whatever, but you design it and then you figure out how to get the materials to do it. And with us, it's really been the opposite. We are really trying to the extent that humans are possible to let go of their like egos and artistic agendas, step back and try to ask like, okay, what are you trying to be? What can you do? A bamboo pole has the potential to last hundreds of years within a structure. It's harvested and treated, and by the way, also sequestering its carbon. In the clump, 
it actually dies and erodes back into the environment within 10 years. There's like something that I can relate to about the bamboo, not as being like harvested and killed, but as like given its next stage of life and its contribution can be lasting within a building. There's so much in that that has so much to teach us that I want to understand how I can relate to it in other materials. That's so interesting, your flip perspective there, looking at the material you're going to be using and how that fits into what you're trying to build versus the other way around. And when it comes to bamboo and and all the different structures you've built this far, what has been the greatest challenge working with that material? So it's uniqueness. I love and extol the virtues of the unique beauty of each bamboo pole. And like, I'd go so far as to say that that's really what hits home. Say at the school, the kids are in a structure that's made of a whole bunch of components that are each unique. I think inescapably connects in with their psyches of each of them are then allowed to be unique and can be self-expressed together as a group, creating a community. If all the pieces that make up the building are also unique, I think there's like something really special there that connects it all. It literally gives us permission. When you see something unique and varied doing its job elegantly, you get to do that too. That said, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare to make a window frame up against a structural column when neither of them have a straight line on them. You literally have to carve one to fit the other or plane them both. You can't even plane the pole to make a straight line because it's a curved pole. And because its meat is only so thick and you erode the structural integrity of it. It's literally like so much hand craftsmanship needed to relate to the form in its original, beautiful, very strong form. Especially architects listening, the penny's probably dropping and like, oh, right, the pole tapers and varies and has nodes. And it's like, it's insanity. With wood, you know, once in a while you do something unique with like an intact piece of wood, but mostly you plane it down into more likely a square or you make two by fours and that's what you're basing it on. In bamboo, everything is based on tolerance. Every piece of furniture we make, we don't just specify what kind of bamboo the leg is, but we specify whether or not each node lines up with what part of the chair and what tolerance of diameter is possible for that leg. Because if it goes past seven cennies, it looks too bulky. And if it goes under four and a half, it's too flimsy. It's insane what we're doing. The natural variety of the material and the decision to try to utilize the material is insane number of like specifications on a drawing and decisions by a craftsman. The craftsman's eye in choosing whether to rotate the leg of the chair, how much to show to feature a beautiful thing or to conceal a scar because it was harvested out of a forest is madness. You guys are true artists. <laughs> and you're working with different kinds of bamboo. How many different varieties of bamboo do you work with? Like routinely five, sometimes another five. And there's thousands of types in the world, you know. That's just so incredible. I think it's what, over 1,400 varieties? Yeah. Like around the world, there's so many. Something like that. It's insane. We have a, a cool guy who works with bamboo in Vietnam working with us right now, and he's a master, and he has a whole relationship to bamboo based on an entirely different type of bamboo that's not even hollow and amazing things that he can do with it. So we're like bending his brain here in grappling with just even a different kind of bamboo, let alone people who show up having never touched bamboo and like ready to be involved. It really bends your brain. Wow. And you're only, what, 40 years old? You're just getting started. Yeah, I'm 40 next year, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it's been crazy. I just didn't know any better, you know? You don't realize when you're not an architect and you're not a builder and you're 28, you're like, sure, let's take charge of building houses for people. But what advantage do you think that gave you not being a builder or architect where you weren't trained in classical rules and that's allowed you probably to expand beyond, you know, what your thinking would have been limited by? Well, I mean, it just comes down to like being possible to have considered it because I was too naive to know better. But I don't know. I sense that some architects who are conscious of it, like mourn something that they have been shut off from by being properly like trained. And through the process of studying architecture, they, the ones that I meet around here sometimes, I think fear that they lost something or it locks something off. 
sometimes I get that feedback from them that like, you could think of that because you hadn't had the training. So training in anything can be a benefit and a disadvantage, I believe. So how has the community at large of architects and designers, how have they responded to your work? I mean, all kinds of ways. I am amazed at how much we have connected in with just like an amazing high level group of people in the world, probably a lot just through the TED Talk, right? Like that was an incredible launching point just to be on anyone's radar. I mean, something I'm super proud of is that Thomas Heatherwick had us in his studio do a talk one evening when we were in London. And he's actually not an architect, but like he's an incredible builder of spaces and things. And like he also comes from outside of the box or some other part of the stratosphere. And the VNA had us display a lot of our structural models there and then took one of them into their collection. So we have the structural model of Sharma Springs. I'm talking about like the bamboo model that looks like an architectural maquette, but is actually the blueprint of the house because that's what the builders follow in order to build the house. So it's the structural blueprint in 3D. Made of bamboo. Entirely made of hand-whittled bamboo. The bamboo is whittled to be a corresponding diameter to what the pole should be in the building. And the engineering of the building is felt out intuitively, also studied in computer programs, but it is tested and understood intuitively while building the model because it's made of bamboo and then it's going to be made of bamboo. So anyway, that model is um, now part of the VNA collection. So that's amazing. Wow, I'm in a gallery. I went to art school and now work in a gallery, at, uh, a museum. Sorry, not a gallery. That's kind of an ironic, cool thing. And then like filmmakers, like the team from Apple TV showing up is like an incredible thing. So we just had a lot of like international attention in a way that usually doesn't lead necessarily to getting a job here to keep us going, but like feeds our souls and like makes it feel worthwhile in a bigger way than like our own needs as a team and then our clients direct needs. Like it brings a conversation bigger and I want to see like how that can connect in with the rest of the world. I'm working on the Bamboo U like online online version now because people can't visit so easily at the moment. So we're creating something online. I mean, I just, I really want it to be something where we really help it translate what Bamboo can teach us, translate what we've learned or been forced into learning from working with this material and unlock something about that that helps with all kinds of other approaches to design and to creation and to building. And once this pandemic's over and people can, tourism picks back up again, if people do visit Bali, can they come and see the work you've been doing or is it, you know, structured off? How does it work? How can people go and check out what you're doing? Well, Green School has tours. I'm sure once it's appropriate to, they'll open it up again to have tours. People always love experiencing the campus. It's all held within the shell of what the structures are. Like that really set the bar. The amazing things must happen in this space. Like that's what the structures do, right? They really hold the bar. But it's all really about what the kids are doing and learning and creating inside of that. And so you get both on the Green School tour. I love that. But people are also just really curious to see like inside of like a highly detailed, like handcrafted bamboo home. And some of the owners at Green Village make that possible by offering tours or having access when they're away. So people can do that. And then more and more so there are some spaces around Bali and around the world. In Las Vegas, Area 15 is about to open and it's like this wild event space. And we created a feature sculptural like space within that space. So there's a piece of it in the USA and there are little bits, little projects we have in different parts of the world happening now. So it's not just Bali. You mentioned the chorus at Bamboo U. What's the next big thing for you and your team? Um, surviving a pandemic, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> keeping sane, keeping our commitments, keeping our projects sane in light of like very changing priorities and issues with the whole chain of things and including our clients and like just trying to keep a balance through that and figure out how and what is really worth doing and what is needed. Like what does the world need from us next? And who's got the funding to do that, <laughs> to show up and take the steps through it. A lot of it seems to be in hotels. Do you foresee yourself ever rebuilding the fairy mushroom house for your kids? I can't build anything from my kid. My baby is yet to be seen, but my five-year-old is very much clear on what he is willing to wear, whether or not he's willing to cut his hair and exactly what angle, which bamboo pole in his playground in the yard needs to be. And so me designing him a house is like out of the question because I would not get it right. <laughs> he, he is very clear. <laughs> this must either be genetic or contagious. 
but he is clear that he has a say in like what his body and his space and his world could be like. So we will probably go through a harrowing process at some point of him saying, but I want a room like this and drawing it and then me having to figure it out. And I will really understand my mother at that point. (laughs) It'll come full circle. (laughs) God, Seriously though, um, my sort of like Balinese father figure, he was our gardener when I was growing up. He and I have like stayed close over the years and he now lives at our place part-time. Part-time he lives in the village with his family and part-time he lives in a little a little house near our place. And he goes through this process with Nyan. There was a project nearby and he took the leftover bamboo and he started building a tree house and I didn't even have anything to do with this. And then he and Nyan start discussing it. And then Nyan's like, we need to add a slide here and it needs to go like this and he'll draw it and he'll like debate it with Patmade. And, and so they've got something going on and I just stand back and enjoy that so far. But like, He's amazing. He got really frustrated. We came home and Patmade had like taken the initiative to go ahead and like add a new part. And Nyan was really upset because it was not aligned with what he had already been imagining. So he got really frustrated. He's like, okay, let me draw it. And then he's like, and then it should go here and then there. And then Patmade was like gracious enough to like adjust it based on what Nyan was saying. <laughs> it was like, it was amazing to see. It was like, what have I created? <laughs> well, the way you're portrayed in the documentary that Apple did. You were like that as a kid with your costumes. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. My poor mom. And like the poor tailor. What like Balinese village tailor knew what a puff sleeve was. And I was like, had it in my head to be Mistress Mary and had been reading like Western fairy tales. What a clash. What a culture clash. You guys know what you want. It must be genetic. (laughs) So, Laura, before we conclude here, how can the listeners connect with you after the show? Um, See the the beauty on... Instagram and in our website portfolio. A lot of it's just really fun to see all the photos of these spaces and people visit obviously and take really cool photos and see beautiful angles on the buildings, and discover parts of them. The Apple documentary, Apple TV Plus home series, that's like the most incredible encapsulation of it all. Just filming, they filmed the process of building and they filmed the design team working on it together with me and construction and, and then like some really cool people around the world did interviews to speak about what they thought about it all, including Donna Karen and Bia Gingles. And so for sure, the Apple documentary is just like a feast for the eyes. And I was actually really kind of proud and happy that it came out in, what was it, April, which was like the first intense month of like many people in the world, like being at home and to have a documentary called Home come out. And like, it felt like it was this little gift of inspiration and perspective on the world in the context of being at home and thinking about homes. It's a really cool series to watch from that angle as well. And now we're creating Bamboo U courses. So restless folks can actually connect with what we do without being able to get your hands on the material, but still really get a sense of it. So we're working on that. And beyond that, like just someday, once you can wrangle it again, like it's really worth when you travel going somewhere to do something, to connect with what's unique about that place, to do some kind of a workshop, to absorb the kind of culture, because we're not just jumping and flitting around on planes anymore. We're going to be traveling, I think, with much more intention and purpose. That's beautiful and so true. And Laura, any final thoughts before we part ways? Well, I guess my question would be like, what about what we do connected for you, like inspired you to reach out to us in terms of health, how do you see what we're doing as being connecting with health for people? Oh, so many ways. Just the connection to nature and the interconnectedness with the natural world and and using materials from that world in a non-toxic way. That's kind of what comes to mind right away. And you know, the other part of it that we don't often get to in conversations about health is like, is the deep need that we have for like inspiration and hope. There's so much, especially now, that gives us good cause to feel constricted and fearful and apprehensive. And whatever extent we can get reprieve from that by noticing something that connects with what we imagine would a beautiful future would look like for ourselves and for the world. Like I think I'm always like searching for what kind of world is really worth saving and what would it look like and what would it be made of and how would we feel about it, not just from the look of it, but also from like the core ingredients of it and the process and the participation in it. I love that. Let's end on that. Beautiful. Alora, thank you so much for coming on the show. And we're going to link everything up in the show notes. 
Keep doing the great work you're doing. I'm definitely going to keep following it. And I hope to come back to Bali someday and, and check out everything you guys are doing. I hope to see you here. Thank you, Laura. Bye. I really enjoyed that conversation with Alora, and I hope you did as well. We'd love to hear what you thought of it over on Instagram. You can tag Alora Dora, that's E L O R A D O R A, and at Ultimate Health Podcast. And take a picture of yourself listening to the episode, a short video clip, or you can take a screenshot of the player. We'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 373. We have links there to everything we discussed today and so much more, so be sure and check that out. And before I let you go, I want to give some love to my editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jay, thank you so much for all the hard work you do. It's much appreciated. And this week's fun fact is that I've been upping my intermittent fasting game lately. I've actually been going till lunch a couple times in the last little bit without eating and it's feeling great. And I don't know how long term this is going to be, but it's an experiment right now and I'm enjoying it. Have an awesome week. I'll talk to you soon. Wishing you ultimate health.